So in this presenter view, I can't see the chat. That's what you were saying, right? Um, no, the viewers won't be able to see the chat box. Um, and we're live, by the way. Okay. You're able to see the chat box, right? The Zoom one? Not in this view, I can't. Okay, it should be, um, uh, because you're sharing your screen, it should be at the top. Okay. If you I just sent a message. Oh, I see. Got it. Okay, okay I got it. Okay, awesome. Good evening, web shadowers. We would like to thank you all for attending our session tonight. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Ali, a board certified ophthalmologist. Your screen should be. Um, as always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments and on our Instagram bio at the end. With that being said, Dr. Ali, you may start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fatima. I am an ophthalmologist. I just wanted to thank everyone at Web Shadowers for setting this up. This is such a great opportunity for people to do this during the pandemic, I think. Um, all right, so I know there have been a couple other ophthalmologists who have presented, so there might be some overlap in material, um, but we'll get started, okay? Um, and feel free to ask any questions or anything you may have, okay? All right, uh, so I just wanted to share a little bit about myself first. Um, I had kind of an unconventional route to medicine. Um, my, instead of doing a traditional undergrad and um, uh, a traditional undergrad in medical school, which is four years and four years, I ended up doing a combined program that was at uh, University of Missouri in Kansas City. So you go through that out of high school. Um, and what ends up, you, you, what you're doing is you're doing six years of your undergraduate and medical school. Um, so kind of going to school year round. Um, but the advantage of that was, sorry, that we did get some extra time afterwards to um, in our clinical years to do a lot more, lots of different rotations and get exposure to a lot of different types of specialties, which I was thankful for because that's how I was exposed to ophthalmology. Um, I then did my intern year at uh, John Peter Smith Hospital, which was in Fort Worth. And then I went back to Kansas City for my ophthalmology residency. Um, and then I chose to do a cornea fellowship um, in Atlanta and I am now in private practice in Chicago. Um, all right, so I just wanted to add kind of an overview slide about why I chose ophthalmology or why it would interest maybe others as well. Um, there's not a lot of exposure to ophthalmology or just eye anatomy or eye pathology, eye issues, I think in medical school, because there's just so much other stuff that you have to cover. Um, so I think if you have the opportunity to get exposed to ophthalmology and you're interested in it, then you know you should definitely think about doing uh, maybe more in-person shadowing post COVID um, or taking a, making sure to do a rotation in it early in your medical school career. Um, but in ophthalmology, like the reason, these are just the reasons why I really enjoy it. There's definitely a wide variety of pathology in that you see in the clinic. Um, and I don't think a lot of people don't realize that they're just like, it's the eye. It's such a small part of the body. Like what could, what else could be going on with it? Um, but we see a lot of different, um, diseases that affect the eye and actually a lot of them can be systemic diseases. So diabetes can present in the eye, hypertension, an early onset of early signs of a stroke can present in the eye. And a lot of patients won't even know that they have another systemic disease going on. Um, for instance, we'll have patients come in and say, hey, there's something going on with my vision. So I wanted to come to the eye doctor. And then we take a little look in the back of their eye and they have changes from diabetes. And that's how they get diagnosed with it. They just never went to a primary care doctor to see anybody. Um, 
there's a lot of office-based procedures and lots of cool lasers that we use. Um, so not just the not just being in surgery or being in the OR. Um, there's quite a few procedures that we can do in the office itself. Um, and it's a good balance of surgery and being in clinic. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoy being in clinic and seeing patients and still being able to go to the OR and to perform surgery there and having other procedure days um, also in the office. Um, and surgery, I think when you think of surgery, you usually think of you know, bigger general surgery type cases where there's lots of blood and guts, things like that. Um, and I'll show you some videos at the end of the um, presentation today where um, you'll notice that eye surgery actually tends to be very clean surgery. Um, and it's actually, in my opinion, is actually quite elegant to see and do. Um, and I think the probably the biggest benefit of being in ophthalmology, it's, it's, it's a very rewarding very, very rewarding um, field. Uh, if you think about it, a lot of patients and a lot of us may take our vision for granted. So, you know, even the slightest discrepancy or the slight, a slightest issue in our vision impacts our daily life significantly. Um, and typically with ophthalmology, the types of procedures we do and the types of surgeries we do, um, the patients are very grateful. They're very happy because vision is such a big part of our lives. All right. So, like I said, I had done a fellowship after my uh, residency. I did a cornea fellowship. Um, so, there's different types of fellowships that can be done after residency if you choose to do so. Um, you can not do a fellowship and be a general or comprehensive ophthalmologist. Um, there, the other specialties besides cornea are glaucoma. Uh, pediatrics, uh, retina, uveitis, neuro-ophthalmology. Um, so they're all different types of fellowships to specialize in. So as a cornea specialist, what do I do? Um, so we treat external diseases of the eye as well. Um, so eyelids, conjunctiva, sclera, um, and sorry, I missed oculoplastics. So that's also a big um, fellowship as well. Um, so these the external diseases will see a lot of um, things that affect the outer layers of the eye as well that get referred to us, um, particularly things involving um, the lids in, ter in terms of inflammation of the eyelids or conjunctiva, um, lots of different types of conjunctivitis that might not just be viral, um, inflammation of the sclera, um, things like pterygium, which, it, which affects the conjunctiva as well. And obviously lots and lots of different corneal disorders that we see. Um, and then surgically what we do in as a cornea specialist are different types of cornea transplants. That's the main thing. Um, so we have full thickness cornea transplants where we are replacing the entirety of the cornea. Um, that's called a penetrating keratoplasty. Um, and then the newer types of transplants are just partial thickness. So DSEC and then DMEC, which is an even uh, newer type of procedure which replaces an even thinner part of the cornea. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, some cornea specialists also do refractive surgery. So my training also involved that. So doing LASIK and PRK to correct people's um, vision. Also a very cool part of the um, field using different types of lasers to help people be contact and glasses free. Um, a lot of, uh, many cornea specialists also do more advanced type cataract surgeries like people with very mature type cataracts, which I'll show you that um, might be a little bit more complex. And then also doing laser assisted cataract surgeries and different types of premium lenses and advanced technology lenses that are used um, during cataract surgery when they're implanted in the eye. So I wanted to just do a brief overview of eye anatomy. So we're um, a little bit more familiar with the case and when I kind of delve into that, okay? Um, so this is a, a semi-section of the eye here. This front layer is the cornea, so that's what I specialize in here. And then we have the space between the cornea and the iris is called the anterior chamber. That's where the aqueous fluid is. And then in this photo, the iris here is blue. And then the pupil, which is the opening within the iris, that let light pass into the eye 
through the lens, which is here, through the vitreous, which is the jelly in the back of the eye, and then onto the retina right here, which is where your photoreceptors are that um, collect all the information that we have. And then the macula is the central part of the retina where we have our more precise vision. And then the, I wanna just draw your attention here to the lens a little bit more. And then the lens is held on to the side walls of the eye with these little fibers called zonules that are on either side. And that's attached here to the ciliary body on both sides, which is where the aqueous humor is produced. So kind of similar on this side, just another cut of the eye. Here again, cornea, that clear window. And then the iris here, which is the colored part of the eye that will dilate and constrict in responses to light. And then that pupil, which is the center opening. And then the lens, which is behind the eye here. And then the vitreous, which is the jelly in the back of the eye. And then the various layers here of the back of the eye. So a little bit more of a focus on um, the anterior chamber. Which is, um, sorry, the anterior segment of the eye, which is the front part of the eye. So this is just a more zoomed in view. So same thing again here, which is the, the cornea, which is that front clear window. And then the anterior chamber, which is that space between the cornea and the iris that's filled with aqueous humor. And then the iris here, and then the lens that's behind here. And then here you can get a better view of those strings, which are basically zonules that suspend the lens to the side walls um, of the eye. And then the sclera, which is the outer layer of the eye here. And then kind of a similar view right here, kind of a little bit more simplified. All right, so I just wanted to go over the basics of the eye exam. Um, so there's lots of different parts to the eye exam. So I just wanted to cover the main parts that will that are the most important, and then um, that are that will also be relevant in the case that we're going to be going over. So we've all heard of you know, these are standard vital signs. Um, we also have ocular vital signs that we consider the most important parts of the eye exam. So visual acuity, um, the pupil exam, and intraocular pressure. So how is visual acuity measured? Um, that's typically with the Snellen chart, which is this chart that I'm sure many of you have seen at any doctor's office. Um, and this is usually interpreted by the bat. That big E is the 2400 letter and then the smaller lines um, is usually go down to 2020. So what do, what do those fractions mean, right? So the numerator is a standard dis testing distance from the, uh, from the patient's eye to the chart, which is 20. Um, so we test at a standard distance. So the numerator is always 20, meaning 20 feet. And then den denominator is the distance that that person can read the same figure or line. Okay. So the 2020 line means that um, a patient with ideal vision or 2020 vision can read the, that particular size of letters 20 feet away. And then, so someone who has 2050 vision um, at 20 feet, they can read that particular line that a um, another person would, uh, sorry, a, they can only read that line at 20 feet that maybe someone with better vision would have been able to read at 50 feet away instead. Um, so the 2050 vision is worse than 2020 vision. Um, and so as the denominator increases that is incrementally worse vision. Um, so that big E is considered 2400 vision. Right. So the pupil exam is next. And the reason this is so important, because um, it can give us a lot of information um, 
about the response uh, of the pupil to light. So the pupil is that opening within the iris, that's the entryway into the light. The light enters the eye through that, goes through the lens and gets focused from the lens onto the retina. Um, so when we're looking at someone's pupils, we wanna assess their size, um, also in relation to each other, their size. Um, if there's any asymmetry between the sizes, uh, the shape of the pupil, is it round, is it oval? Um, the position of it, is it centered, is it off-centered? There's some diseases that can cause that, and then the color of each pupil too. Um, the most important, thing um, that's part of the pupil exam is the response to light. So we want to look for a relative afferent pupillary defect, which is here, you can see that it's called an RAPD. And this assesses the light reflex pathway, or basically the parasympathetic fibers that are um, detecting light input to the eye and causing that constriction of the pupil to happen. Um, so in patients who have a defect in that pathway, um, the pupil doesn't respond properly. As you can see here, when the light's shown here, it dilates instead of constricting, which is the normal response. So that really indicates, you know, is there um, something going on with the retina, with the optic nerve um, that's causing that, uh, cornea just to not, that people, sorry, to not react anymore. Um, right. So the next um, vital sign is intraocular pressure. And so that is the pressure within the eyeball itself. So the, like I had pointed out in that first pic anatomy picture, the eye produces aqueous humor from the ciliary body, and it drains um, through the trabecular meshwork, um, which is the drainage system in the eye. Um, this is measured in millimeters of mercury. A normal eye pressure is anywhere from 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. Um, and there's different things that can cause this to be too high that we get concerned about and in cases where it's too low that we get concerned about. So high, traditionally people think of high intraocular pressure as glaucoma, and then lots of inflammatory disorders, inflammatory diseases of the eye can cause um, an increase in pressure as well. And low pressure can sometimes happen after surgery, if we have a leaky wound and it's causing fluid to leak out, that can cause a decrease in the pressure, and also a retinal detachment, which occurs in the back of the eye, it can also cause a lower eye pressure to happen. Um, the most standard way we check pressure is with um, this device here, which is called, an, which is applanation. So basically we put um, this yellow fluorescein dye in the eye on the surface of the eye. And this has a little tinge of blue, um, but usually it's a little bit brighter blue light that fluoresces off the eye um, to give us a measurement of the eye pressure. So within ophthalmology, there are a ton of abbreviations. Um, these are just the very, very basics. I think my first few months of residency, I was just learning a ton of abbreviations. Um, so let's just go over the very basic ones to, so we'll be able to discuss our case a little bit better. So the right eye is, is OD, left eye is OS, both eyes together, OU. Um, and then when you're testing vision, um, you want to know, is it with correction, meaning is the patient wearing glasses, wearing their contacts? So with correction is CC, without any correction on is SC. And then abbreviations for the terms we just learned, visual acuity is VA, intraocular pressure, IOP, um, anterior chamber is AC. All right, so let's go over this case here. So 75 year old retired teacher presents to your clinic with a gradual decrease in her vision over the course of one year. She notes that the vision in her right eye is worse than the left eye. She has found night driving to be particularly difficult during this time, especially with oncoming headlights from other cars seems to be really bl just blinding her. And it seems like her glasses just don't work for her anymore. She denies any pain, any redness, any light sensitivity. All right, so from here, is there anything else you guys would wanna know? What else would you ask the patient or?
All right, I have the chat box up if anyone wants to kind of chime in. Is there anything you would else want to, anything you'd want to ask her? Yeah, the pressure of the eye is a good question. So that would be more um, within the exam itself, past medical history, that's really important. Um, family history is really important as well. Does she have any other disorders, uh, ocular disorders running in her family that she may know of? Um, how long is it happening? I think she said about a year. Medications can definitely cause um, a decrease in her vision or fluctuation in her vision. Um, we'll kind of go over some of those as well. Diabetes is definitely a good um, um, question to ask her. Um, changes in your blood sugar can also cause your vision to fluctuate as well. Um, all right, so let's here. All right. So past ocular history, she denies any having any previous eye surgeries, any eye trauma. That's always really important to ask about trauma, amblyopia or strabismus. Amblyopia is um, pretty important to ask, especially if it's a new patient to you. You want to know how long has this blurry vision been going on for? Amblyopia is basically the term for a lazy eye, right? So if the vision just didn't properly develop in someone's eye when they were a child, because it wasn't corrected, they didn't get glasses, or they had um, a deviation of their eye that wasn't corrected, um, which is called strabismus, um, ocular medication, she is denying that. Past medical history, she said high blood pressure, well controlled. Surgical history, she had an appendectomy done about 20 years ago. And then family history, so she said no evidence of blinding diseases such as glaucoma or macular degeneration in her family. Social history, denies smoking, alcohol or drug use. Like we said, she's retired, she lives with her husband, medications, she's just on one medication, lisinopril for the high blood pressure, no allergies, and then denies any other symptoms um, in, the, in the other systems. Okay. So from here, we wanna move on to the exam findings. All right, so visual acuity, CC means with correction, so probably with her glasses, that's the most common. So OD is about 2070, OS is 2040. Her pressure is 14, 15 in the right eye and 14 in the left eye, which is a normal pressure. Anything between uh, 10 and 21 is considered normal. Pupils, they're equal, they're round, reactive to light, and no afferent pupillary defect. Um, so this covers all, um, this covers the criteria that we wanna look for when we're doing a pupil exam. Are they equal meaning equal in size? Um, the shape, is it round? And are they reacting to light? And no EPD meaning is each pupil detecting light and constricting appropriately. So extraocular movements and confrontational visual fields. I didn't go over this in the vital signs, but these are, um, commonly done with most of our exams, especially when you have a new uh, patient as well. So extraocular movements is being able to move your eyes in all directions. So we check for that. And then um, confrontational visual fields. And someone asked about peripheral vision. And that's kind of how we get a rough idea of how someone's peripheral vision is doing. But she, her visual fields are also full in both eyes OU. All right, so we want to move from here to the physical exam of the eye, basically. And so when you're doing the exam, um, you want to kind of think about your anatomy picture. And when we do an ophthalmology exam, we're moving from anterior to posterior, meaning we're moving from the front part of the eye to the back of the eye. Um, and that's how I look at my patients. When I examine them, I start with the lids and lashes and then keep going deeper and deeper into the eye. Um, 
as we examine it. So lids and lashes within normal limits, no edema, no erythema, which is redness of um, the lids, so nothing like that. Sclera and conjunctiva is clear, no redness on either side. Her cornea is also clear on both sides. Anterior chamber, which is that space between the cornea and uh, the iris, is deep and quiet. So deep and quiet meaning we are assessing the depth of that space. If that depth starts to become very shallow, you can get um, a angle closure glaucoma. So that can be concerning, but hers is deep and then quiet, meaning there's no inflammatory cells, uh, white blood cells floating around in that aqueous humor in, within the anterior chamber. So that's why we say that the anterior chamber is quiet. And then iris is also within normal limits on both sides. So the lens here, we have something going on. So OD is noted to have three plus nuclear sclerosis and OS is noted to have two plus nuclear sclerosis. I'll show you guys pictures of what that means. And then dilated fundus exam means that we gave her dilating eye drops to expand the size of her pupil. So we have a view into the back of the eye to look at the vitreous, the optic nerve, and the retina. And that was within normal limits on her exam. So does anyone have any thoughts on what these lens findings could be? Given her age and her decrease in vision. Yeah. So someone said most likely cataracts. Yeah, and that's correct. Um, that, let me show you the next picture here. So this picture here, I want to kind of draw your attention to this central area. So this is the iris out here. She's been given, this eye has been given dilating drops. That's why the pupil is so large here. And so when the pupil expands, what's directly behind the iris is the patient's lens. So in this patient, the light is going right through. You can see all the way to the back of the lens very easily. This is very clear. There's no cloudiness. There's no opacification here. So this is a clear, natural lens, okay? And then you kind of move over to this eye, which I would say um, is probably more like the case patient's right eye. So again, same thing here on the edge, you have the iris, and then this pupil is dilated here. And then you look at the lens behind that and you can see all this cloudiness and yellowness. Um, and this is the cataract, okay? So in our differential diagnosis, we've kind of already identified it as a cataract, um, but you, wanna, you want to be thinking of what can be causing this, these symptoms that she's having, this gradual decrease in vision in both of her eyes, right? Um, without any pain, without any redness, anything like that. Um, so cataract in this patient, is what's going on. So there's different types of cataracts. Um, they can be age-related, which is the most common, um, which just means that as people get older, they develop cataracts. Um, you can have traumatic cataracts, which if you've had any previous injury to the eye, you can develop a cataract sooner in that eye. And then things like diabetes, um, inflammation, previous eye surgery, um, if you've been on steroids for anything, and then radiation exposure all can cause different types of cataracts as well. Um, someone had asked about her peripheral vision and her intraocular pressure um, at the beginning of the case, which are also important findings because those can be, um, if the pressure is elevated or she has a constricted peripheral vision, then that can be indicative of glaucoma, which can also cause to a decrease a uh, gradual decrease in vision loss um, without any pain. Uh, and then macular degeneration can also occur when you get um, deposits within 
the macula, which is that center part of the retina, um, that can also cause that gradual decrease in vision to happen. And then another one to consider, especially given this patient's history, was hypertensive retinopathy. If patients have had longstanding high blood pressure or episodes of really elevated high blood pressure that can start to cause damage to the blood vessels in the retina. Um, and the same thing can happen with diabetes as well. All right, any questions so far? All right. We sent in the questions in the chat box. Okay, sorry. Um, so it could be glaucoma, like I said, that's when you want to evaluate also the eye pressure um, and her uh, visual field. So we did that with, we measured the pressure and then um, looking at her visual, confrontational visual fields were full. Um, so where does the cloudiness come from? Which is a really great question. So it's actually a breakdown in the lens proteins within the um, natural lens. So as you get older, those lens proteins start to break down and cause that cloudiness to happen. Um, this is probably a pretty typical case of cataract. So we'll, um, towards the end of the presentation, I'll kind of show you um, the really uh, mature or advanced cataracts as well and different gradings of it. And then someone said, what's the black spot on her eye here? So that, this is what I'm guessing you're um, talking about. This is actually like a freckle on her iris. This is called a iris nevus, but good pickup. All right. So what is the lens? So going back to that picture, that anatomy picture we looked at, the lens is a biconvex transparent structure that is behind the iris. And it kind of uh, separates the front portion of the eye, the anterior chamber versus the posterior chamber behind the eye. So the job of the lens is to focus the incoming light that comes through from the cornea, goes through the anterior chamber, through the pupil, and gets focused from the lens in onto the retina. Um, and that is what gets our images sharp and in focus onto the retina so we can see clearly. So a cataract is the opacification of that lens and that's due to breakdown of the natural lens proteins within um, that structure. And this typically occurs with age, happens to everyone as they get older. Um, I would say the process usually starts in your 50s or so and it's very, very mild. And then as you continue to get older, um, it can start to get worse and cause more cloudiness within that lens. So other risk factors just besides age, diabetes can um, increase your risk of cataracts or have the cataracts happen sooner, especially in patients with an uncontrolled blood sugar that can happen sooner as well. Um, use of steroids, either oral inhaler steroids um, can also cause um, cataracts to form faster. And then, like I said, trauma, um, any previous um, eye surgery, um, kind of the similar concept can cause a cataract to form faster. Having previous uh, inflammation or inflammatory disorders within the eye can happen, can cause it to happen faster. Smoking, UV radiation um, can all cause the cataracts to form sooner than they would naturally form. All right, so I just wanted to break down the lens anatomy. This, this picture has a lot going on on it, but there's just a few things in particular I wanted to point out so we can go over the different types of cataracts. Um, so the nucleus is the central part of the lens here. And then you have a layer of cortex around that nucleus. And then this is the front part of the cataract. So that's the anterior pole. And then the posterior pole is back here, um, which has a layer of cells here too. So I just wanted to point out those three structures in particular, because those are the types of cataracts that we are going to discuss. All right. Um, so this kind of just gives you an idea of what the natural lens is doing and then what happens when a cataract forms. So in a clear lens, the light entering the eye goes through the cornea, through the pupil, and then gets focused from the lens onto the retina. Um, so you get a sharp image here. 
So when you have a cataract, this lens starts to get really, really cloudy, and then the light that's entering here ends up getting scattered or actually blocked if it's very cloudy and very advanced. Um, and so instead of forming a sharp image on the retina here, you get this scatter of light all around. So you get a lot of glare from that and just a decrease in vision, blurry vision. So those are the primary symptoms that patients will complain about when they have cataracts is a decrease in their vision. And my vision just isn't sharp as it used to be. Um, I can't, I just can't see as well as I want to. It's blurry, it seems kind of dim. Um, a lot of patients will say I need a lot more light when I'm reading. Um, text looks really dim. Um, and then because of that cloudiness and that diffraction of light, as you saw in the previous picture, um, many patients will complain about glare and halos, especially from direct light sources. So in everyday life, the most common scenario for that is nighttime grinding. Um, and having oncoming headlights directed at you can cause patients with cataracts a lot of glare. Um, and that can be pretty significant um, and kind of just blinding to patients who have very significant cataracts. Um, also decrease in color, contrast sensitivity, all just because of that cloudiness. Within that lens, you're just not getting that sharp image that you want. And um, another issue that happens is that as a cataract starts to develop, it can cause a change in a patient's prescription because of the, that structure of the lens is changing, right? And how it's focusing the light onto the retina is now changing and that induces a change in people's prescription. So, there are many types of cataracts. I'm gonna cover the three most common that we see. And these are um, most common and most commonly age-related types of cataracts. Okay? So that's why I wanted to kind of point out those other structures within the lens before. So let's do nuclear sclerosis first. Actually this picture, um, kind of similar to the other one, a little better breakdown here. Um, showing the nucleus, which is in the center. So when this starts getting cloudy, you get a nuclear cataract. And then the cortex, which is this layer surrounding the nucleus. Once that starts to get cloudy, you get a cortical cataract. And then posteriorly, if you get this plaque of cloudiness just at the back of the lens, that's called a posterior subcapsular cataract. Subcapsular because this green or green layer is the capsule, which goes all the way around the eye, uh, all the way around the lens, sorry, and that is underneath that capsule. So these are some pictures here, but we'll, I'll show you some kind of zoomed in ones a little bit better. So nuclear sclerosis cataract is the most common type of cataract, the most common type of age-related cataract. It's pretty slowly progressive. Um, and this is what causes the lens to turn that yellow or brownish shade in very advanced cases. And they typically occur in both eyes. Patients can have very asymmetric cataracts though, um, causing one eye to be affected more significantly than the other. And these typically cause problems with distance vision for patients and a decrease in contrast sensitivity. And like I had mentioned, patients can have a change in their prescription as a cataract develops. So this commonly happens with this type of cataract, with a nuclear sclerosis cataract. And um, patients can become more myopic or more nearsighted with their prescription. Um, and so actually some patients who were maybe farsighted or hyperopic and they start becoming more nearsighted because of the cataract will say, hey, I can actually start seeing better. And that's a phenomenon called second sight. Um, but it's kind of short-lived because as the cataract continues to develop then the vision becomes worse. All right, so let's go over some pictures here. Um, so this top uh, outline of pictures shows just the way we grade um, different types of cataracts. Um, so in our case, we had a patient with a two plus and a three plus nuclear sclerosis. Um, so you can see that here. And that's graded based on how cloudy that center part of the lens is or that nucleus of the lens, how cloudy, how yellow, how brown is it? Um, so you can see in one, it's there's just barely any cloudiness there, barely any yellowness. And from two, there's a little bit more. 
three gets starting to get a little bit more cloudy or is pretty significant, lots of yellow. And this is what we would call a brunescent cataract, which is when it starts to get brown. Perfect. Any questions so far? Any questions about this? Um, so someone asked, what causes a cataract to be worse in one eye than the other? Um, there's, there's really no reason. Um, it's kind of just age related. Um, and we typically tell patients that it's very common to have cataracts in both eyes and they can be different in both eyes. We treat each eye differently and into, almost independent of each other. You know, um, If one eye's cataract is more significant, then we'll um, do that, treat that cataract first. And we may, some patients may not have a need to treat the other eye till many, many years down the line. Um, what do you mean by the back of the lens? So the back of the lens is the inner side, um, basically meaning that it's on the, facing the rest of the eyeball. Let me show you this picture here. So this would be the back of the lens that faces the inside part of the eyeball, whereas this is the front part of the lens or the anterior part of the lens, which is facing, which is directed towards um, the cornea and the front part of the eye. Um, does nearsighted versus farsighted increase the chance of developing a cataract? Not necessarily. And then how do you prevent a cataract? So the Risk factors for cataracts are what you have to consider in prevention of a cataract, right? So UV, UV light um, can cause a um, increase in the formation of a cataract. So when you're outside, wear sunglasses, right? Um, if you're a diabetic, you wanna have good blood sugar control. Um, If you're on um, steroids for any reason, you want to talk to your primary care doctor, you know, and talk about it, how you can maybe decrease steroids, things like that. Obviously, some patients have to be on them. Um, does the amount of sleep you get impact your eyes? They can. Um, I, I don't think it, it sleep shouldn't impact the formation of a cataract, though. All right, so let's move on to a cortical cataract. That's the next type we're gonna cover. Um, so this is when the lens develops spokes or white uh, wedges um, from usually from the periphery entering the center of the lens. And these can be bilateral, also asymmetric. Um, cataracts can progress in, at different rates in both eyes. So you can have one that's worse than the other eye. Um, and these typically cause more significant glare symptoms. And um, you'll kind of understand that a little bit better based on the picture. And they can also vary greatly in progression. Um, some patients will have cortical cataracts that don't really bother them and they kind of stay stable over many years. Others may have ones that develop more quickly and rapidly causing their vision to be affected more significantly. So these are cortical cataracts. So you can see these white spokes coming in from the edge um, of the lens towards the center of the cataract. And so this is um, this can cause significant more, significantly more glare symptoms for patients because as you can see, there's just different lengths here um, and different depths that can cause is just another point for the light to refract off of um, and really cause that glare to happen. So as these spokes approach the center here, as you can see, these spokes are more central. These will start to cause more significant issues with vision. Um, as opposed to when they started off at the periphery of the lens. 
All right, so the next type of cataract is a posterior subcapsular cataract. This is a central opacification at the back or the posterior aspect of the lens. And this usually occurs directly in that path of light. It's more centrally located. It doesn't really start in the periphery. Um, and these tend to progress very quickly and can have a significant impact on your vision because they tend to be so central. Um, and with that, patients notice more issues with reading vision and can these types of cataracts are can also cause a lot of glare and halos around lights. Um, for PSC cataracts in particular, more risk factors outside of just being age-related, chronic steroid use, diabetes, trauma, inflammation. Um, we tend to notice that patients who are in those categories tends to develop PSC cataracts more than the other types of cataracts. So here you can see um, the way this eye is illuminated here, this lens, the front part of the lens is um, not so cloudy, maybe a little bit of nuclear sclerosis, a little bit of yellowing in the front part of the eye. But as the light is focused on the back of the lens, you can see this thick plaque here, and that is a posterior subcapsular cataract. And so you can see why trying to see through this would be so difficult and the patients get significant blurry vision and glare. And here's another view of that. This view is called retro illumination. So you can see that dense plaque right in the center of the lens that would interfere with someone's vision. All right, and then we talked to, someone had asked about the degree of cataract. So this is what we call a very mature cataract. Um, Hopefully someone comes in to see us before it gets to this stage. So this is uh, very significant. As you can see, it's the cortical aspect of this is pretty dense. So once the cortical, those spokes start to go all the way around and they come into the center, you get this white um, cataract here. Um, and then even without the direct illumination of the light, you can see that yellowing or browning of that nucleus behind here. So this is a very, very dense cataract. All right, so management. So what do we do for this? Um, so patients come to us with cataracts in very varying degrees um, of their formation. So patients with very early cataracts, um, they may not be bothered by their vision. Um, it's really not an issue for them. So we can usually just update their glasses prescription or contact lens prescription to compensate for any change that may have occurred due to their cataract. And then patients who um, have a more substantial cataract and it's really affecting their vision, their glasses really aren't helping anymore, then we go to surgical management, right? And what is involved in um, cataract surgery where you are taking out that cloudy lens, that cloudy cataract, and we replace it with an artificial intraocular lens. And so that intraocular lens is typically made out of acrylic, which is the most common material, so plastic material, and or a silicone material. Um, and the way we determine that best lens is we do a ton of different measurements um, in the office to determine what is the best power of that lens. Um, so some patients will ask, well, can't you just take the cataract out and just leave me with nothing? Well, if we did that, you wouldn't really be able to see very well at all. Um, because like I said, the lens, the job of the, your natural lens is to focus the light well onto the cornea so you can have a sharp image to see. So if you don't have a lens, you're not really gonna get that focusing power and you'll just be blurry all the time. Um, all right, any questions so far? Before I get into more surgery stuff. Can different forms of cataracts happen at the same time? Yes, absolutely. Um, patients can have all three types of cataracts going on at the same time. Um, and that can definitely impact their vision any uh, further. And there are certain demographics that are more prone to cataracts. Um, so I think when you think of demographics, we tend to think of um, the different risk factors or what demographics have those cataract risk factors higher in that population. And those are the types of populations that we tend to see more um, cataracts in or more 
um, mature cataracts in. Um, so is there any treatment for a mature cataract? Just surgery. Um, Yes, the lens that's placed in the eye is permanent. There's very rare occasions that we will um, do another surgery to exchange the lens for any reason, but typically the lens that is placed um, during the time of cataract surgery is permanent. And then what age do cataracts occur more commonly? Um, so cataracts, like I said, usually start in your 50s or so, very mild, very early. And at what point they start to affect patients is very variable. So we'll see much younger patients. We'll see patients in their maybe early 60s who may have mild cataracts and they say their symptoms are really bothering them on a, on their in their daily life. Um, so we kind of go based on how much is it affecting the patient and their lifestyle. Whereas we might have older patients who have very significant cataracts, but they're doing okay. They are able to do what they want to do in their life. And they say, I don't, you know, I'm okay. My vision is fine for me. And so we kind of just monitor those patients. All right, so let's uh, get into the surgery here a little bit. So prior to the late 1960s, um, the way we did cataract surgery is um, this method called extracapsular cataract extraction. Um, so this is a little cartoon here and then I'll actually show you a video. Um, so you can see here, this dotted line is the incision that's being drawn here. So this is about 180 degrees around the eye, which is a big incision for the eye. Um, so in terms of size, this is usually probably 10 millimeters, which doesn't seem big, but in the realm of eyes, that's a big incision. And the reason why it's so big is that they had to have a large enough incision to use this instrument, which is called a lens loop, place that in the eye and take out the entire cataract in one scoop. Um, and then the second reason that lens, that incision was so big is that this is the intraocular lens, the plastic lens, that goes into the eye through the same incision. And so you can see that here. So the issue with it is, with this procedure was that there's a lot of sutures involved here to close this giant incision. So I can show you that here and this. So here you can see this very white, mature, dense cataract. This is the iris that's been dilated with eye drops. And so this is not my video. It'll have the doctor's name here um, at the bottom. So I just wanna make that clear. And then, but I'll kind of guide, guide you towards this procedure here. Um, so here they make an incision in that conjunctiva, which is that outer clear layer of the eye. So that's the top layer that you wanna get through. They're just doing a little bit clean up there and then they'll do a little bit cautery to stop some of those blood vessels from bleeding. And then what, so you can see the size of that incision is pretty wide. And then they'll start to enter the cornea um, and the anterior chamber through the cornea so that they can get access to um, the lens here. So this blue dye that they just injected is to help stain that capsule, that top capsule. Um, so the way we access the lens is by making an opening, which you'll see here, in the capsule of the lens, which is that very top layer, the capsule like I had showed you, goes all the way around the lens. So to get access to the bulk of the cataract, we have to make an opening in the capsule. So this is called a can opener capsule. Okay, so you can see now it's um, open there. They're making the incision much bigger now because now is where they have to take out the entire lens. And so you can see that kind of coming out there. And then you have to suture up this entire wound here all the way around to close that. And 
So before they finish uh, removing the rest of the cataract, they're gonna make the wound a little bit smaller so they have a little bit more control um, of the eye here. You can see that happening. We're closing a little bit more of it on both sides. And then they're going in with this aspirational device to take out the rest of the cortex. And you can see the iris is already, the wound is so big that the iris is starting to come out of the eye. And this is just kind of the problem that was with this type of technique. Um, so they're getting the pupil back open and then they're in putting that lens into the eye in the place of where that cataract was. And then they will suture the rest of the wound closed. You can see lots of sutures going in to close up that wound here. Sorry. Um, so they have about five sutures there to close their wound. And then they just check and make sure it's not leaking. And that's about the end of the procedure. So that was the older type of procedure. And then in the late 1960s, they developed a phacal emulsification type procedure. Um, so phacal emulsification is the use of ultrasound energy through a probe or handpiece um, that is used to break up the cataract. And the same handpiece, as it's breaking up the cataract into small pieces, is vacuuming out those small pieces. So the advantage here, you can see how much smaller this incision is right here. This is that phacal emulsification instrument or the ultrasound handpiece that goes in and starts to break up the cataract. And because our incision is so much smaller, we have now developed a way to inject the lens while it's folded up. So we can use that same very small wound um, to inject the lens into the eye and it opens up in the eye. So I'll show you that in this video. So the next video is awake. So if someone asks, is the patient awake? Yes, the patient is awake. Um, we typically do our cases under local anesthesia. That means we numb up their eye. Um, uh, we can give a little bit of medication just through an IV to help them relax a little bit, um, but they're, they're still awake. Um, and the reason for that, especially with um, modern cataract surgery is because we want the patient to um, be fixated um, on our microscope light that we're using. This, the sutures that were placed are not dissolvable. So usually after a few months, they're removed in the office typically. All right, so this one is my surgery. Um, so I'll kind of guide you towards this, all right, that. Um, so very, very small incision. That was about a one millimeter incision in comparison to what we did with extra capsule that was a 10 millimeter incision. So we're talking significantly smaller here. Um, so we're injecting, um, this is called viscoelastic, which is a material, this jelly-like material you can see there that helps to maintain the space of the anterior chamber. So this is our main incision. This incision is about two and a half millimeters. It's much smaller than what people were doing with extra caps or cataract surgery. Uh, this is that opening within the capsule. This is called a capsulorexis. So we use that little hook to get that opening started. And then these four sap like instruments to kind of get that all the way around to get a nice opening into the capsule. So we now have access to the rest of the lens or the rest of the cataract. Okay, so you, as you can see, this patient has that yellowing, which is nuclear sclerosis, and then they have those wedge spokes, which is the cortical cataract. So here we're injecting some saline between the capsule and the cortical component of the cataract, and that's so we can get the cataract to be pretty mobile within the capsule. So you can see that it's kind of spinning there, all right? 
a little bit more of that jelly material to kind of maintain that space. And this instrument here is that phaco emulsification or ultrasound handpiece. So you can see, um, we start to make this groove, which is already breaking up the cataract and removing very small pieces of the cataract as we make that groove, that first groove into the cataract. So what we'll do, there's lots of different ways people do cataract surgery to break up the cataract once they're in the eye. Um, I use a method where I uh, divide it into four quadrants and then remove each quadrant. So that first groove, we split it in two. So now we have two halves and then we split each half um, into a four. And then that makes it a little bit easier for this hand piece to kind of suck out um, that quadrant of the cataract, which you'll start to kind of see happen here. Now there's one quadrant coming up and it kind of just breaks it down and sucks it in all in one motion. Um, and it's breaking it down with that ultrasound energy. So as you can see, much, much faster. Um, obviously this video is sped up. Um, usually cataract surgery nowadays can be done 10, 15 minutes. Some of the very experienced cataract surgeons can do it under 10 minutes. So this is that bulk of the nucleus, which has been now removed. And so you can see these kind of wispy edges that are still left. That's the cortical cataract that's still left. So we go in with this even smaller handpiece, very, very small tip here on that to suck out the rest of the cortical material leaving the capsule intact in the back aspect of the lens. And just a little bit more cortex to remove. And the reason we want that capsule intact in the back of the lens is that this now has, this has created basically a bag, right? So we have an opening in the front part of the capsule, the back of the capsule is intact. So that new intraocular lens, the artificial lens will be held in place in this capsule or bag. So more of that jelly material to inflate that bag, make sure we have plenty of space in there. So this is pretty cool. This is the injector for the lens. So the lens is loaded into this all folded up, as you can see. This is what allows us to get the lens into the eye through that very small incision. And then we kind of just wait for it to open up a little bit. That's it. And then we do a little bit more cleanup. And typically with modern cataract surgery, with how small our wounds are now, we don't even need to put in a suture. Um, the wounds are pretty good at sealing on their own. So we wanna get that lens nice and centered within that capsule. And then we use a little bit of sealing to what we consider what is called hydrating the wound or just making it a little bit thicker so it'll stick to itself and seal up on its own. And that's about it. And we just check the wounds, make sure they're dry. There's no leaks coming out of them. And that is how we do modern cataract surgery. All right, so prognosis with this. Um, this is with, these numbers are for newer fecal emulsification type cataract surgery. So cataract surgery improves vision in about 95% of patients. So that's huge, right? And 90% of those patients will have 20-40 vision or better after their surgery is done. Um, vision typically improves um, very quickly. So within a matter of the next day to within a few weeks, depending on how dense the cataract was or if they have any other pathology going on. Um, do cataracts come back? So cataracts don't come back. So as you can see, the, that entire natural lens is removed and an artificial lens is placed. Um, you can develop sometimes some scar tissue that develops on that posterior capsule that was left in place. And that is what we call a secondary cataract. Um, and it's called 
it's called that because that posterior capsule starts to get a little bit of scar. And so we call it posterior capsule opacification. So how is that created? We just do a quick laser procedure in office to clear off that scar tissue off the back of the lens. And that's also a one and done thing. Once you've had it done, you don't need it done again. So very, very good results, very good prognosis with cataract surgery. All right, I've gone a little bit over. These are my references. So again, thank you so much. Thank you to Web Shadowers for setting this up. Um, my name is Fatima. I'm a cornea specialist. This is my email if you guys ever want to email me. I'm also on Instagram. You can message me on there. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions, I think. Could this surgery be performed by robots? It maybe it could. Um, it had. It's not that is not being done now. So the other advancement in cataract surgery that we've had now is we can do laser assisted cataract surgery. The laser doesn't do the entire thing. Um, the laser can help to make the incisions. It helps make that anterior opening in the lens capsule. And then it also helps to break that cataract down into very, very small pieces. So we still have to go into the eye and finish breaking it up and removing those pieces. Are there any complications from the surgery like going blind after? Okay, so complications from surgery are very low with cataract surgery. Um, like, that's a, like that statistic said, 95% of patients do great after surgery. Um, it would be very rare for patients to go blind, but it can happen um, if they've had significant complications with their surgery. Is recovery time significantly less? Yes, recovery time is way less than it was with um, extracapsular cataract extraction. Um, really the only limitations we place on patients maybe for a few days, even after surgery, um, to not do any heavy lifting. So they're not straining their eyes, um, not to go swimming in a public hot tub or public pool just to prevent infection, maybe for a few days or a week after surgery, but they can typically go back to doing any other activities that they wanted to do. What, if, what do you do if a patient panics during surgery? Um, so usually we give some type of mild sedative. So like an oral Valium just to kind of calm down their nerves. Um, I do a little bit more. I'll give a little bit more IV medication just so they're calm during that time. Um, we always have anesthesiologists around. Um, I always have an anesthesiologist when I, in uh, the surgery, when I'm uh, working on someone. Um, and that is a great benefit, right? So they are always on board, they're monitoring the patients, um, they can assess if they're getting calm, getting too anxious, give them more medication if they need to. Right. Any other questions? Does it get hard to perform surgeries with the eye constantly moving? Yes, it can be. So, um, the patient will see a light from our operating microscope. Um, and that's just the focus beam of the light. Um, so we always tell them, focus on that light. That's what you, that's your goal throughout this procedure is to focus on that light. That keeps their eye in the right position for us, keeps it in the, cent the center of our uh, microscope field. Um, there are all, all patients, you know, who might be very old, who might have dementia, who aren't able to maybe focus or cooperate. And for those patients, we take um, other precautions. We might give them a retrobulbar block, um, which is a paralyzing injection that goes around the eye that paralyzes the movement of the eye. Um, but really, those are done pretty rarely in uh, very special scenarios. Um, the bubbles in the surgery were just from the fluid. Um, those will kind of go away on their own. All right. Just looking at screens throughout the day have a ne negative effect on the eyes. Um, so the biggest effect that we are seeing nowadays, especially with the pandemic, is people coming with a lot of dry eyes just because they're focused on monitors and screens so much. Um, the best advice I can give for that is, you know, every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, take a break, just look away, 
from the monitor, make sure you're blinking. Um, and if you're still having a lot of dryness to use moisturizing drops, artificial tears. Um, do I work along optometrists? Yes, we do. At our practice, we have a few optometrists and we uh, work with them and they see a lot of um, the same types of patients that we see too. So like I said, cataracts don't redevelop after surgery. As you saw in that video, you're taking out that entire lens and putting in a artificial lens. So um, we don't get that actual cataract coming back. You can get this opacification of that uh, capsule behind the new lens implant. That's called a posterior capsule opacification. And then we use a laser to treat that in the office. Um, what convinced me to become an ophthalmologist? Um, a lot of the surgeries, um, I think the surgeries are pretty cool, pretty fascinating. Um, and giving people's vision back to them is a very cool thing to do. And it's very rewarding. Yeah, the residency application is a different process. So the main residency application is ARIS. Um, ophthalmology is through an early match called SF match. So if you're interested in ophthalmology, you should kind of get involved pretty quickly or as really as soon as you know. Um, so you can work on doing your rotations, getting letters of recommendation, doing research, because the match does happen earlier for ophthalmology. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for such an informative presentation. We all learned so much from you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And the videos were also very interesting. Great. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Everyone, make sure to check out her socials. Her Instagram is Fatima Ali MD. Additionally, thank you all so much for attending this evening. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Um, the link to the Google form is going to be posted now in the chat. So everyone make sure you fill it out within the next 30 minutes. Thank you so much again.